Joined now by Slava Malamudi, math teacher from Baltimore, as he says on his Twitter handle, but of course, a blogger and a hockey journalist who still writes for the hockey news and someone who is, I'd like to think, increased our knowledge of all things Russia since he got to North America yeah, and started writing about him and joining us here on Sakaris and Price. Slava, thank you for making time. Appreciate that. Good afternoon. Thank you. Dominic Hasek has called for NH the NHL to suspend the contracts of Russian players. What do you think of that? Well, Dominic is my childhood hero. I, um, I'm have to, I have to say that uh, his entry into politics uh, kind of filled me with trepidation uh, because that rarely ends well for for athletes. Uh, but. Uh, he has turned out to be a very uh, thoughtful, very sane uh, politician who generally has great things to say. I don't necessarily agree with this take. Um, I think that uh, just singling out players for being Russian is uh, not the way to go. Uh, people are individuals. They have their own opinions. And uh, they can't help where they were born. Uh, I think that... Um, Suspending Russian teams who do represent the nation is absolutely the right way to go. Uh, uh, but individuals should be treated as individuals. And uh, those players who are not explicitly supportive of Putin don't have anything to answer for. Mm. Let's flip it around. It's a, it's a difficult line, though, Slava. You know, like when, you know, how far back are we willing to look at national team appearances and how much are we looking to parse the words and let's face it some of the words may not even been be attainable to us from a research point of view in terms of support wow. of, of putin when it comes to national teams that's pretty cut and dry the russian national teams have been banned uh by pretty much all sports organizations by now and there's absolutely the right move um i know some of the organizations uh, they had their hand forced i know fifa Definitely is in the pocket of big Russian money. Definitely did not want to ban him. But after basically all the teams said, we're not going to play these guys, um, FIFA was faced with a choice of whether, you know, to award the Russians the World Cup by four feet or by or to ban them. So, you know, really not a choice. IHF, absolutely in the, in the pocket of Russians, uh, also had no choice because the Finns and the Swedes all came out and said, no, these guys got to be banned. So that's easy. But when it comes to individuals, I mean, you have to use your common sense. I mean, uh, there is a presumption of innocence. Uh, there are a lot of Russian players are oblivious about uh, anything, really. Uh, it's, it, other than hockey, I don't think they're substantially different from uh, uh, many Canadian players in that no, respect exactly. either. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, just uh, approaching somebody like, you know, Vasilevsky or Kaprizov or... Uh, or she's talking and asking them, uh, what do you think about uh, the war in Ukraine? I mean, that's okay, because they might be worried about it, but uh, it's not okay to assume that they bear any type of responsibility. Let's flip but when you have a player like Kovechkin, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, you have a player like Kovechkin, that's a completely different story. Let's flip it around to Canadian players in the KHL. Is there a political or moral obligation, do you think, for a Canadian hockey player to say, I mean, they might for their own safety want to come out of Russia just for fearing what would, all this is going to lead to, but should they take it upon themselves? Should there be an expectation the Canadian player leaves a KHL team to come home? I think if I'm a Canadian player right now, first and foremost, I'm, I'm, i got to be thinking, uh, about my financial well-being. I mean, the Russian ruble has collapsed overnight. Uh, the Russian economy is in the tank. Um, pretty soon, there's going to be severe restrictions on the Russian uh, on the on movement and um, banking transactions. Uh, it just might not be very prudent for any Westerner to be playing in the KHL right now. Uh, two t two clubs have already left the league. Uh, and as, but when it comes to a moral stance, I mean, I'm not going to be advocating one way or the other. I think it should be on the player's conscience. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. do I want to be in this country right now while it's butchering its neighbor? I mean, that's something that every player needs to answer for themselves. But you're right. If, you know, 
Uh, he's that Canadian player shirt. Now, hey, checks might be coming to an end anyway because the playoffs are about to begin. But is that Canadian player sure that the yeah, next I mean, paycheck I mean, is going to happen? Exactly. exactly. And, you know, and also, am I, I'm a Canadian player right now. Uh, I know what's I know because Canada has a huge Ukrainian population. Uh, am I going to be standing there listening to the Russian national anthem before the game? Right. Am I going to be standing there uh, performing for the benefit of fans, many of whom are very fervently supporting of the war? Uh, am I performing for their entertainment? I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's a moral dilemma that they should answer for themselves. We know Vladimir Putin was a judoka at one point and uh, has since had his uh, honorary title there in the International Judo Federation stripped. How important is sports to him and to the advancement of his administration? How important has sport and athletes been as propaganda tools for him? It's important in ways that uh, people in North America don't always appreciate. The thing is, think about 1972 and what that meant to Canada and then extended through the entire history of Canadian sports and multiplied by about a hundred because Canadians, I don't think really thought of sports as anything related to politics until 1972. And I don't think they rarely even thought about it since then. Whereas in the Soviet union, Sports have always been not just a part of politics, sports were politics. Sports was a, an integral part of Russia's foreign policy. Um, international sports were governed by the propaganda department of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. That, that department was responsible for the national team's performance. And if they underperformed, that's the department that had to answer for it. And that culture hasn't changed at all. Uh, sports are financed by the government. The government forms the narrative, shapes the narrative about their, around their performances. Uh, players who compete uh, for the national teams are uh, officially, set, it is said about that, the, that they represent, not represent, they defend the honor of the motherland. That is how it is phrased. Uh, and uh, if you deny that part uh, of uh, your everyday life to Russians, that is a big impact. I've been saying this since 2014, since Russia annexed Crimea. If you want to add any type of behavior change uh, from, from Russia, you really should ban them from all international sports. It might not change Putin in any way at all or his inner circle. They're all about uh, you know their own agenda. But a regular Russian Joe, uh, <laughs> or Ivan as it may be, uh, <laughs> will be... Uh, will be very, very personally and deeply affected by this. You take their, his soccer away from him, you take his hockey away from him, uh, or biathlon, that's like the third biggest sport there, uh, they're going to scratch their head. Like, uh, is this government really making Russia great? Uh, where's, my, where's my soccer team? That is a big part of their lives. That's a major diversion. Somebody in Magnitogorsk has nothing to live for other than his hockey. And that's I mean, that would really change a lot of people's minds. People of our vintage, uh, old enough to remember, you know, the the tales of Alex McGillney getting to North America, the shadiness of Pavel Bure uh, and his draft uh, and and others. We default to thinking Alex Ovechkin is in grave danger if he speaks any more strongly about his ties to Putin. Do is that the no. the Cold War in us bringing that up, or or do you think he's do you think he's far more free to speak on the topic than than we give him credit for? Yeah, it's the Cold War. It's probably uh, a few Bond movies that are speaking yes. here. You know, even <laughs> when McGillney when McGillney defected in 1989, uh, he himself was declared a deserter. And he definitely faced a tribunal because he was an officer of the Soviet army. He was faced a tribunal if he ever came back, but his family was never touched. Right. Um, that, that would kind of be pointless and no, really no gain for them to do that. I mean, there's nothing to be gained from executing somebody's family. The person already escaped. Uh, and nowadays it's even le more ludicrous. Uh, Putin does not go after celebrities just let celebrities do their celebrity. He, he understands that there's no upside there. And 
that that's just one part of it. Uh, you know, Panarin has not been persecuted by the state at all. Uh, a former coach, a deranged guy, Andrei Nazarov, tried to score points with, with the Kremlin by slandering Panarin, but that got nowhere. Uh, and that's one part of it. Like he's a, he's too rich and too powerful and too famous to be uh, to ever be targeted. And the second thing is, even if if they were in any danger, they'd be on a plane yesterday. There's no 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 problem in getting them out of Russia. The reason they are in Russia is because they know that the that Ovechkin is a genuine, uh, genuinely in Putin's pocket. He genuinely loves Putin. He uh, he supports him. And if you read that really, really embarrassing statement that he read out a couple of days ago, he didn't say the word Ukraine. He didn't say that he uh, opposes what Russia is doing. All he said is he hopes it ends soon, which, you know, if you listen to it, that's pretty much equivalent to saying, I hope we smash them real quick and it ends. You know, and when asked about Putin, he said he is my president, and he still has uh, uh, Putin's picture on his, uh, his, uh, in his, bio, uh, in his bio on Instagram. There is obviously no regret. There is no, I mean, he helped shaping the narrative. He actively helped shaping the narrative that uh, Putin is using to invade Ukraine. Back in 2014, Ovechkin jumped on that whole Ukraine is, is a fascist state bandwagon that Russian that the Russian propaganda used uh, in order to you know justify their annexation of Crimea and their invasion of Donbass. Ovechkin was a part of that effort. Nobody ever called him out on this, really. And the Washington Capitals really, really uh, put the clamps down on the media when they did try to say something. And, and now, eight years later, people are dying, and Ovechkin had a major role to play in. And he's not sorry for it at all. Uh, in terms of Hashik and NHL players, maybe Russian NHL players having their contracts suspended, we're seeing in tennis, we're seeing in hockey, international hockey, we're seeing in um, soccer and other walks of life. I mean, it's possible that these Russian hockey players in the NHL might be the highest level elite athletes left standing uh, competition wise um, outside of of course some uh, soccer professionals scattered about is that enough like russians making it in a north american hockey league making it in another european soccer league is that enough in terms of sports excellence for putin and the state does that oh, serve um, enough propaganda uh purposes or does it um, need to be bro broader and more widespread yeah well, first of all, let's be honest. Russian soccer players are garbage. Everybody <laughs> knows about it. Russians know about it. There is no, I mean, it's, they're the butt of every single Russian joke. Uh, even those of them who somehow made it to the, to Italy or to France or wherever they play, they basically, uh, bench, bench warmers there. It's just, it's, it's, it's not even funny. Um, so hockey players and tennis players are definitely the hottest commodity and, uh, because, and they're the only ones standing because they largely represent themselves and not, and in, in the case of the NHL, they represent their corporate, <laughs> their corporate entities that are the NHL hockey clubs, uh, while it was players represent themselves, the tennis players. Uh, so that's why it's kind of tough to sanction them. The only thing that's happening right now, for example, in tennis, uh, a Ukrainian player said that she's not going to play any Russian opponents. Uh, a lot of other tennis players could come out and say that. I doubt it's going to happen unless things really, really get horrible in Ukraine. Uh, but, uh, you know, other players could just boycott Russia. And that, that, might, that might happen. Uh, in, I, I think the NHL is never going to go down the road of, uh, you know, just banning Russian players or suspending them or having them sit out. Uh, that would probably amount to a political purge, which... I, if I know Gary Batman and I know him pretty well, not going to happen. Um, but uh, players who are actively pro Putin, I don't see why not. And I, but I think that I think that first and foremost, it's the media that's supposed to be spearheading this, not necessarily banning them, but making them score, making them uh, uh, ask uh, answer tough questions. Uh, I don't see why. 
our Canadian teams in the NHL can't play the Ukrainian national anthem before every game, especially when Russian plays the team. See which one sits down. You know, I can't see why um, uh, why the media can't be constantly harping, you know, on this uh, on this question, especially you talk about Ovechkin and Malkin and Varlamov and you know players who are kind of known to have supported Putin on social media and otherwise. Slava, you've given us great insight. Thank you for your time here today, sir. We wish you the best. Thanks so much, Slava. Yeah. Appreciate Thank it. You.